Hello and welcome to another episode of the Veterans Corner. My name is Chuck Warden and I'll be your host. Uh, as we said the last show, uh, Monique is not with us again, but she will be back in February and she wanted to say hi to all the viewers and she misses all of us, so she'll be back. Uh, I, I did this show with oh, well over 100 shows by myself. And then when Monique has been here, now I'm so used to a co-host. <laughs> Uh, I got to relearn all over again. But uh, we were, the topic for today is a very important topic. It's part two of a very important series. Uh, we, we mixed it up a little bit. We didn't get through all the questions on the first part. Right. So, and, and those, are very, those are very, very important questions that we didn't get to. So what we're going to do is we're going to push that second show that we were going to talk about about guilt and regret. Yeah, and, and you noticed I was looking. Um, <laughs> you know, off into the spring rotation and we're gonna complete the questions okay. uh, that we didn't get. Uh, it, it's very important uh, that we get to these because it matches up with uh, the part one. And, you know, uh, for those that don't know, uh, we have Dr. Jean Folks here. She's a licensed professional counselor uh, at the, and she's the director of the Connecticut Therapeutic Psychotherapeutic Resources in Avon. I'm doing this without my glasses. Uh, she's been on the show a number of times. Uh, great uh, information, a topic that we've talked about as PTSD in the past. You bet. Uh, numerous times. And it's really great to have you back, Jane. Thanks, Chad. Uh, Justine Ginsberg, uh, she's been on the show a number of times also. Um, and it's great to have you back. Uh, Justine is the founder and director of Resilience Grows Here. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, we're gonna jump right into this so we make sure that we get all the questions. All the way through, yeah. All the way through this time uh, versus what we did the first time. You know, it, it was very infor informative. Mm -hmm. uh, the part one was, you know, the questions that were asked uh, needed to, the, to be answered in the way they were. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're gonna jump right into this. And for those that didn't see the first part, um, it will air on Nutmeg, uh, it's on YouTube, it's on the Veterans Corner Facebook page. Once it goes on YouTube, I put it on there, so you can't miss the show. Um, it's out there, you know, for, for you to see. Uh, we're not going to review the first first questions. We're going to go right into the one we left off, okay. and that is, what biological factors increase the risk for suicide? Illness can certainly increase feelings of suicide, especially if it's a chronic or debilitating illness. Uh, depression, mm -hmm. absolutely and certainly, is um, an influence in more than 60% of all suicides. Mm -hmm. So uh, chronic pain mm -hmm. can definitely drive someone to suicidal feelings if they have tried every medical avenue imaginable and nothing has really taken the edge off, off of their pain. Um, getting hooked on certain prescription drugs mm -hmm. uh, quite innocently that were prescribed by a physician. Uh, but uh, with chronic pain, it's hard to manage without medication. But the medication itself can both cause um, debilitating depression and it can stop working and it can also be very addictive. So there are a lot of secondary um, medical and physical factors that can really influence feelings of, of wanting to die. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think the other thing that's important when we look at um, medical or medicines that can influence, definitely um, hormone therapies, particularly mm. with women and, and young, young women who are taking the birth control, the oral birth control pill. Um, there can be, with some strengths, an increase in suicidal ideation based upon hormonal influences. And there are some um, psychoactive medications as well that can actually have that reverse effect yes. and can increase um, a person's suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for folks at home when they're taking medications, if they're starting to feel a change in the way they um, are viewing their ability to cope and are perhaps starting to have some suicidal ideations, mm -hmm. definitely discuss that with your general care practitioner. Yeah. If you're on a prescribed medication or if you start to take a new medication and suddenly you start to have feelings that you haven't ever had before because sometimes they are related mm -hmm. to a drug therapy that somebody's on. Anyone that watches TV nowadays, 
Yeah. You know where I'm going. Uh, yeah. Every every time there's a break and they go to commercial, mm -hmm. there's there's some medication that's being advertised. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, there's a list about this long of mm. things that negative. Uh, uh, With a narrator going 100 miles a minute. Yep. And everyone's uh, skipping through a field looking terribly happy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's a, like, a, a, and, and, and most of the time, a lot of those are feelings of suicide. Yeah. Uh, of the medications that, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it changes biochemistry. Yeah. And there is a biochemical component to so suicidal feelings. Yeah. Um, this is a question that I've heard people ask in the past. Uh, is it, in, can you inherit that feeling of, uh, of suicide? There is no suicide gene. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, it is not genetic. However, um, tendencies towards depression can run in families. Mm -hmm. And we also know that when there is a suicide in a family, there's a psychological dynamic mm -hmm. called, uh, I just went blank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Help me, Justine. It, uh, it happens to me uh, all the time. So. Suicide <laughs> contagion. Yes. Uh, that um, suicide is more likely to happen in a family or in a community mm -hmm. where other suicides have taken place. Yeah. And it's a very, very interesting and troubling psychological phenomenon, but it's quite real. And so when there is a suicide in a family, you want to be paying attention to mm -hmm. the other members of the family very carefully. Yeah. I think it's also one of the things we always advise in um, families, in small communities, in workplaces or in schools. If somebody is lost to suicide, all of those directly, we often call it the ripple effect as well. The, you, know, you throw a, p a pebble into the pond and the, those ripples, yeah. that all of those people directly um, affected seek counselling and seek counselling early, even if they feel as though they haven't been affected. Mm -hmm. Often there's a deep um, effect that often goes unnoticed for a period of time. And that risk factor really does increase if you have lost somebody in your immediate family or your immediate friendship group to suicide in the past 12 months. Now, we discussed this next question uh, in the first show, and it was alcohol and drug abuse. Mm. Uh, does alcohol and other drug abuse, not prescription, right. you know, uh, increase the risk for, uh, for suicide? Absolutely. When you think about um, drunk drivers, mm -hmm. people make the decision to get behind the wheel of a car when they are compromised to make that decision. Yeah. Uh, the same is true with suicidal ideation. People who are compromised by drugs or alcohol, they've lost their editor, mm -hmm. they've lost their executive function, they are not thinking clearly. It both heightens emotion and reduces you know, reason and restraint. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a terrible and combustible combination. I think it's also important to remember that alcohol is a depressant. Yeah. Um, Many people use alcohol as a social lubricant, mm -hmm. that, that glass of wine at night when you come home to unwind. But more than um, a, a small amount of alcohol actually has the reverse effect. And if somebody is already suffering from depression and is feeling vulnerable, yeah. increased alcohol consumption and increased consumption of certain drugs can actually compound that depressive state. It gives them a push. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it makes them more vulnerable and, as Dr. Jean said, less able to be um, responsive to those feelings when they come and to be able to rationalise that these will pass or mm -hmm. there's, there's tools I have in my toolbox that can help me to deal with that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's sometimes that spiral that can start to happen to somebody when, they're, um, when they are struggling with an addiction. I mean, somebody profoundly inebriated are not going to have thoughts like, no. I'm, I'm feeling pretty depressed and distressed right now. They think maybe I need to call somebody. Yeah. That's the last thing that's yeah. going to occur. Absolutely. I know somebody just recently that did that. Yeah. Um, do people attempt suicide to pr prove something or to get sympathy? Um, I think we've, we've touched that a little mm -hmm. bit the first show. Any, you want to talk more on that? 
I think it's a big <laughs> pro yeah, yeah, it's a big problem when um, people are, well, she's just looking for sympathy. Mm -hmm. And people can be very, very dismissive mm -hmm. of people, especially who have made multiple attempts mm -hmm. at suicide. Um, it's, a, it's a profound call for help. Mm -hmm a profound call for help and just because a person you know doesn't take that many pills or you know makes their arrangements in a somewhat um, sloppy or not totally determined way doesn't necessarily indicate that the next time they're not going to be completely successful and is an indicator that something is profoundly wrong and that individual is not being very successful at communicating in just a direct verbal way. And so they have to make a more dramatic gesture to get the point across that I'm in big trouble here and I need somebody to listen to care and to help. And I think it's a really important thing for viewers at home to recognize this is not a call for a layman to make. Often we, we jump to judgment. Yeah. We, we make a, a sweeping assumption that somebody isn't serious or that they're just calling out for attention. They're not feeling as though um, they're, they're um, part of or the centre of attention anymore. That's not for a layman to make that no. decision. If somebody has any indications of suicide or any attempted suicide, that is... Uh, a, a need for a direct referral to a mental health specialist mm. to be able to make that call and determination. And I think sometimes we have a lot of living room clinicians that, that choose to, to make a judgment based upon maybe what they've seen on television or read in a newspaper article. Um, that is incredibly dangerous, particularly when you're dealing with somebody who's vulnerable and obviously struggling. Uh, so if that is happening in your, um, your family, in your community, in your school, in your friendship group, that's, unless you're a licensed therapist or a specialist, that is not your role to make that decision. No. No, I, mean, I, mean. I, I, I think, too, that denial is a very yeah. uh, real element in family members and mm -hmm. friends of somebody who's attempting suicide. Mm -hmm. You don't want it to be true and you don't want it to be serious yes. because then you're going to have to take you know, profound action. And sometimes that reflexive dismissal, well, this is almost a form of wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't really real and she wasn't really serious and he didn't really mean it and, and so we're just not going to have to talk about it. But that is a very, very dangerous gamble. Yeah. I was just going to say, and this almost segues into what we were going to talk about in the next show with that, with that guilt and remorse. Sometimes families feel very threatened by the concept of a family member um, who may be talking about suicide or may have unsuccessfully attempted suicide yeah. and how that reflects on me. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about it because what does that say about me as a parent or what does that say about me as a spouse? You know, I don't want to believe that it's true or real. And mm -hmm. as Dr. Jean just said, it is a very dangerous gamble to make that assumption. And this is not about blame and shame. Absolutely not. This is not about pointing fingers about who didn't do something to make a person feel this way. It's about how do we assist that person to navigate the feelings that they're having. Yeah. Um, it's not about blame and shame. Yeah. So in terms of stigma in communities, we really have to move away from trying to hold an individual responsible for making a person suicidal. Mm -hmm. No one makes anybody suicidal, yeah. um, but they obviously need um, urgent assistance. Yes. Unfortunately, nowadays, there's so much in families where not just, I'm, I'm assuming this talk, topic, but all topics of denial. Yeah. No, they couldn't, that couldn't be my son or that couldn't be my daughter or that of couldn't course. be, you know, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see where that would happen. Uh, in my past occupation as a supervisor, uh, someone so much as hinted uh, mm -hmm. they were, the proper procedure was taken. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you can't... Uh, You're gambling with someone's life yeah, you, if you, you don't. You can't do that. Yeah. And, and like we are talking, and I was attempting to say, but I think I was saying it wrong, which shouldn't surprise anyone. <laughs> um, the first show uh, about sympathy. Mm 
mm. looking for attention, I think I was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I substituted the word with help. Uh, I've seen that a lot, mm -hmm. uh, where they were just you know, crying out for help and this is how I can get it. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, but how many out there that have cried for help that really didn't want to complete it to the end have actually completed it to the end, yeah. thinking you know the, their plan didn't work, uh, somebody didn't get to them in time, or they went overboard. Yeah. My favorite definition of intimacy is knowing and being known mm -hmm. by another human being. Mm -hmm. We all need the experience of intimacy with other human beings, somebody truly understanding me and letting me truly understand you. Mm -hmm. And when I make a desperate plea for help and am dismissed and maybe even criticized or, God forbid, mocked, uh, the, it increases the desperation tenfold because it's saying, I will not offer you intimacy and you are not going to get the experience of knowing and being known. And so it can actually turn somebody more um, acutely suicidal and more determined uh, and perhaps move towards more immediate lethal means. I was just going to say as well, I think one of the things when you talk about that intimacy factor, we often think that being somebody's support system is having all the answers. Mm. You don't have to have the answers to be meaningfully connected to another person. Absolutely. Sometimes it's just hearing and validating that right now we don't have an answer. But I'm not, it's, it's that difference between sympathy mm -hmm. and empathy. Mm -hmm. You know, right now we don't know what, what the solution is, but together we'll find it. And uh, you're not alone, you're I'm not alone. here. Absolutely. And I'm not going to leave you Absolutely. in this terrible, you know, cold, dark place. And I think sometimes that's what stops people asking vulnerable members of their community or their family if they are suicidal because they're terrified that they don't have a solution. It's not, the asking isn't about having a solution. The asking is about connecting, building trust so that that vulnerability can actually be present and together we will find help. Mm. Together we will, we will find a solution that works. We don't have to have it right now. You know, the same problem we had in the first show we have here. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left. Sure. Uh, what we'll do is we'll cover a couple more questions. Sure. We'll save those, the remaining two or three, uh, for the next time. That, uh, that, yeah, <laughs> that, that when we were here. It's all good. Uh, apart from talking to a suicidal person and encouraging him or her to go for counseling, what else can we do to prevent this? Keep talking in general. Um, helping people understand that talking about it does not increase suicidality. Mm -hmm it reduces it. And I think we just need to keep saying that over and over and over again. And building intimacy. The deeper our relationships, the less likely that someone is going to complete a suicide. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, why do people attempt suicide when they appear to start feeling better? Mm. Committing suicide actually takes some energy. Yeah. And sometimes people are so profoundly depressed that they literally have trouble getting out of bed. Mm -hmm. They can't move, they can't function. Even the idea of amassing whatever material is necessary to complete the suicide feels like too much. And ironically, yeah. when someone just begins to come up above the water they, and they have just a little bit of oomph, they say, oh, this is the moment I've been waiting for, and they act on it. So it can be very deceptive for someone to look just a little bit better when they have been talking about suicide and or feeling depressed for a long period of time. You want to really pay attention in that moment when they're just a little bit better, because that can actually be the most dangerous place in the whole arc. Of the journey. And I think also when you look at families and support systems, often people think, oh, we're out of the woods. Like, yes. I can sit back. I don't have to, to call every day. I mm -hmm. don't have to, to continue to have these conversations. But 
that's the moment when someone is the most vulnerable. Exactly, and, and then feels abandoned. Absolutely, so recognizing that part of the support of somebody who is suicidal is really the support any of us need at any point in our lives. Yeah. It's about connectedness. Yeah. Here's a question that, that we've talked about, uh, and it's why do people talk about mental illness? Why don't they talk about it? Like depression, bipolar, uh, disorders, uh, I mean, what, why don't they talk about suicide? Single word. Stigma. 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 Shame. Mm -hmm. yeah. Shame, fear, embarrassment. Judgment. And it's not rational, but there's even fears that it's somehow contagious. Totally. You know, I just don't want to be around it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark Twain said, denial is not just a river in Egypt. And he knew what mm -hmm. he was talking about. He sure did. Um, I actually wrote these notes, and I'm trying to figure out what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was something very, <laughs> um, you very know, profound. What does suicide... Uh, Contagion. Yeah, there, there you go. That's uh, okay. I got I you. I got that. you. I'm glad you got it, and you didn't write these? Well, I mean... It's okay, because I think we actually talked about it in the last show. We did. Uh, we did talk about suicide contagion. Yeah. And... Um, Upping our awareness, checking in with people that are fragile emotionally um, when there's even significant uh, discussion of suicide, even on TV. I know when Robin Williams uh, committed suicide, um, the suicide rate went up mm -hmm. across the country. And because he was such a familiar character and felt like it was almost a family member that we lost. Absolutely, and I think the other thing for families or for parents at home, to be really aware of the types of of uh, social media that your children Absolutely. are viewing and the types of um, films and series that your children are watching. Um, young developing minds have not yet developed that ability to truly computate what is a fictionalized um, story or movie and what is real. There is that suicide contagion can also occur around um, different social platforms and we really need to be aware as parents if our children are viewing these types of this type of content to have open and honest dialogues yeah. um, about what it actually means and the feelings that that might bring to the surface. Um, and that's particularly hard in today's day and age when our teenagers often watch a lot of things and we're not aware. Mm -hmm. So really being aware of what your children and your teenagers are watching on social media. And that media. goes back to intimacy too. Absolutely. Knowing and being known by your children and yes. having those deeper level conversations yes. uh, on an ongoing basis so that you know what's going on in their mind and heart. Absolutely. We've got about 30 seconds left. We're down to the last, we actually made it to the last question. And this is a question that I've heard, it may sound funny to ask, but this is, 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 there, is there such thing as a rational suicide? There's um, divided feelings about that. Yeah. Uh, we speak, spoke briefly in the previous show about suicide amongst the elderly mm -hmm. and the chronically ill. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who do consciously choose to end their life, not so much as an act of de desperation, but as an act of self-determination. Yeah. And we could have lengthy conversations about that, but um, it is, the smaller percentage of suicides, and uh, it happens more, I think, with the chronically ill and with the elderly. Okay. That's all the time we got. Uh, we, we made it through the questions. Wow, good uh, for us. The, the next show that uh, in the spring, early spring, we're gonna be talking about, what was that? Guilt, uh, guilt and regret. regret. There you go, <laughs> there you go. By the time I find it, it will be tomorrow. So um, it, it was great great to have you both here again. Thanks, yeah, really, uh, One thing I really want to do real fast before we sign off is tonight's crew. I always believe in uh, giving the crew their just dues. Without them, uh, we wouldn't be in your living rooms. It's not us, it's the crew. So Lizzie Crawford, the director, Joe Sanborn on graphics, uh, Jerry Beveridge on the cameras, camera three, uh, Francina Sloan is on camera one, and Raf Raf Turi is on. I'm doing it all all night here uh, on on camera two, and uh, that's it for the show for tonight. Thanks for being here. Thanks for viewing. See you next time in the Veterans Corner. Good night. <laughs>